Hi there, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. So in the first two lectures of this module, we have examined what a cause is, and we have looked at the ways in which we can capture the flow of causation of specific causes through a complex network. We've also seen the limitations of that approach. So in order to get at a dynamic mechanistic explanation of how a network works, what it does, what it can do, we need both a mechanistic decomposition, taking the system apart, uh, locating function in individual components, and then putting it together again sort of recomposition. And we've seen so far in the course that we can do the decomposition using genetics, empirical approaches that follow this sort of interventionist causal approach that James Woodward is proposing. So you intervene on the organism by knocking out a gene, mutating it or overexpressing it or any kind of uh, perturbation and then you check uh, what the effect is. Um, so you sort of create the counterfactual situation uh, to empirically test it. And uh, causal modeling, where we uh, learned about two approaches uh, using information theory, this is one of them. So causal modeling is a statistical approach uh, based on mutual information, which tracks the flow of specific causation through a system and allows you to infer um, what people call a causal graph, um, a sort of a graph of causal interactions, uh, which is a, a specific type of network model that tracks um, causal flow in the real system. As I said, this all belongs to decomposition. Um, it doesn't sort of tell us what the orchestrated um, uh, sort of operation of those different interaction actually does and for that we need dynamical systems modeling which we have learned in the last module doesn't give you necessarily mechanistic explanations on their own in fact if you look at a system uh, based on its face-based topology it's more like a topological explanation than a mechanistic explanation so we need to bring these two worlds together again and i'm going to do this using uh, my own work over the last uh, almost um, 20 years was con you know uh, concerned with the uh, regulation of genes in the gap gene system. So we've used this system a bunch of times as an example already. In particular, I used a small part of it to explain the notion of phase space. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this whole gap gene regulatory network in its context of the embryo. And so, as you may remember, um, the gap gene system is the first zygotic um, sort of tier of this hierarchical uh, segmentation gene regulatory networks, where you have in the early embryo of Drosophila, which is depicted here, you have the maternal cord in a gene's bicoid called one hunchback. You see the bicoid protein gradient here, a broad gradient that spans the whole embryo, and then the staggered expression of the gap genes uh, in these overlapping domains, um, which will then together um, regulate the target genes, the parallel genes, and the segment uh, polarity genes, which uh, uh, generate this molecular pattern for, for segmentation later on in development. And so we're going to look at this first step here. How do you get from the gradient to these overlapping gap domains? We've also already covered in last lecture that classically this is seen as a, a French flag, a typical example of a French flag problem um, in the way that Walper posted in 1968. Uh, Biquid is a classic morphogen and uh, the cells in the tissue of the embryo are supposed to be able to read out specific concentrations, especially thresholds, uh, and interpret them by switching on different sets of differentiation genes. A blue set in the interior, white set in the middle, and a red set in the posterior, so you get this sort of French flag-like pattern. Um, I argued that this model is more about uh, tracking the precision of information, so the, the main question here turns out to be how precisely can a cell read out the information of the gradient, rather than looking at the actual uh, mechanism which is much more complicated because there's a lot of cross-regulation between the target genes, the gap genes themselves. Uh, 
So there's a lot of a reg uh, regulatory feedback between those genes. And of course, when I started working on this problem in uh, the year uh, 2000, a long, long time ago, um, there was a lot known about this system already. There were the Nobel Prize winning screens of Nusslein, Folhard, and Misha. So we had a complete parts list of uh, genes and putative interactions based on a lot of genetic uh, and molecular work. And our task was recomposition of the system. How do you put it together again? So it's impossible to put a system like this together from scratch. So if you start at the molecular level and you try, you know, I told you before, we don't understand eukaryotic transcriptional regulation. So you basically cannot start from the molecules upwards. So we started at a sort of a genetic level of looking at gene-gene interactions in the sense of Woodward's interpretation. This, you know, genetic interactions, one gene activating or repressing another, ignoring all the molecular mechanisms um, that underlie this process is a completely perfectly valid um, uh, causal explanation. Because if you perturb one gene, you can track the effect to another gene. So not only can you actually test the model based on those predictions, but the genes, if you perturb them, have specific effects on other genes. So this is something very important that's going to come back a couple of times now in this lecture. You do not have to go down to the molecular level. Often it is confusing to go down to the molecular level. So we're going to stay at what you would call a genetic level. Okay, so the approach we took at that was revolutionary at that time and, and had never been used in biology. And it is sort of to explain it very quickly, I can't go into detail, it's sort of just like the opposite of genetics. Okay, so if you uh, deconstruct the genetic uh, network, what you do is you mutate all the different factors. You see this here, you have a wild type embryo here, the head is on this side, the tail is here, and you have a gap gene called CNRPS, which is expressed in this position. And then you look at different mutants. Here is, a, is a mutant of another gap gene, hunchback. Here is a mutant of two maternal genes. There's nothing here. So basically, CNRPS is activated by these maternal genes. And here, the gene is derepressed. So it means that gap genes are repressing each other. And so you, you draw in the arrows here, one by one, bottom up, and you reconstruct um, the network by drawing uh, what uh, Lindley Darden called a, a mechanistic sketch. You don't know if it's complete yet. But this is a sketch of the mechanism and how you think it works. So what, what we did was completely the opposite. We, we took um, wild type gene expression pattern. And I was lucky. I went uh, to the lab of John Reinitz, who had created an absolutely massive expression data set um, of gap genes um, uh, just before I joined. So we were going to look at those. And then just like we did for this sort of feedback toggle switch between Krupal and Giant. Remember, we looked at the expression pattern and we inferred from the wild type expression pattern what the system does. So we inferred the network from the wild type expression pattern. So in this case, we have four gap genes and four external inputs, two maternal gradients and two what are called terminal gap genes that, that signal from the terminal region of the embryo. And that's a complicated network. We need help from the computer to reconstruct it. So we needed an approach that, that sort of extracts empirically uh, predicted networks out of the expression patterns that we quantified. Okay, and so this is called reverse engineering. It's sort of a top-down version. It does not rely on any perturbation uh, necessarily. You can use mutant data, of course, and make the predictions better. But um, the important uh, thing to know here is it's sort of complementary and independent of the genetic approach. Very important. A little bit more detail, but not too much. I don't want to, uh, to confuse you too much. Um, just to say that we have, underneath, we have a dynamical systems model based on differential equations like we've encountered with the toggle switch. Uh, it, is in a, in a, it occurs in a row of nuclei that divide over time. That adds a bit of um, complexity, but it's not too bad. And then you have equations, differential equations, dg over dt, remember, is sort of the change in, in concentration of a gap protein over time, just like in that toggle switch model we looked at earlier. And the change in concentration of one of these proteins depends on different terms. We've already encountered uh, decay terms, so these proteins have to be extremely unstable. Here you have a decay constant, and the decay depends on the amount of protein that's there. Um, this yellow term is a diffusion term, so the proteins, there's no cell membranes, remember, so they can 
transcription factors can diffuse directly between nuclei. And then this very complicated term up here is a, is a regulation term. And it has two components that you need to, to know about. One is this phi here. Phi represents a sigmoid regulation expression function like this. Okay, it's almost like a switch, a leaky switch. Um, and what you feed into this phi is a, are two big sums, you see. These are mathematical, mathematical sim symbols for sums, and, and the sums are inputs from other gap genes. That's the first sum, and then the external inputs, the maternal gradients, and the terminal gap genes uh, in this sum. Okay, so that's all you need to know about this model. So basically, this whole sum comes from a matrix of interaction parameters that describes the network here of the system. Okay, so you have a number for each interaction. For example, let's take this parameter here. Uh, that is the regulation, it represents the regulation of gene number one, which is hunchback in this case, by gene number two, which is Krupal. So this number can be positive, so there's an activation, it can be negative as a repression, or it can also be zero or close to zero, then there's no interaction. So if you have a whole uh, matrix of numbers like this for every interaction between different factors, you have encoded in this matrix the structure or topology of the gap gene network. Okay, and so uh, of course, when you simulate the whole thing, you also have uh, a phase space that you can analyze. Now, how do you get those numbers, right? We cannot measure those. They're not uh, molecular sort of measurable parameters. We need to infer them. And we do this from uh, fitting the model to a data set of uh, spatiotemporal gene expression patterns that have been quantified. Here are our old friends, giant in blue and Krupal in green. And you can see the protein concentrations of these two factors along the anteroposterior axis of the embryo, which have been quantified along the midline here of this embryo image. And so you have a whole data set of these factors, very high resolution, down to a nucleus, and also down to about 12 minutes time, or even less, 10 minutes time, um, seven minutes even uh, at late stages, uh, very high resolution data set. And so what you do is you simulate the model with random parameters, and of course, you will get a random um, uh, pattern here, and then you sort of mutate uh, the parameters and you use some sort of algorithm. Often what we use are, are uh, evolutionary algorithms. So we evolve this model in the computer to fit the data better. And then when you have a perfect fit or when the fit doesn't improve any, any longer, then you stop the procedure and you look. And luckily for us, we got models through this procedure, through this artificial selection procedure in the computer, we got models um, that uh, fit the data quite precisely. Actually, the algorithms we used were slightly different, but don't worry about this um, right now. So what you get in the end is shown here. You have a data set here. So I'm now showing only the middle part of the embryo. You have the gap genes hunchback. Here's the anterior, here's the posterior. This is the relative concentration of the factors, hunchback, Krupal uh, in green, knurps in red, giant in blue, uh, early during the blastoderm stage of development, and then um, about an hour later here in the late stage. Um, and you can see that what happens in between is interesting, okay? Even just by looking at the data, you can see what I'm tracing here in the middle. This is a spatiotemporal uh, uh, diagram where time flows downwards and you can see the peaks of these gap domains are moving to the interior. And the gap domains, the, wi the width of each domain as indicated here is getting narrower and narrower. And you can see this if you compare the early versus the late data. Um, set. So basically, there's a problem here with the French flag, right? The French flag doesn't explain this sort of shift of gap domains towards the interior. It's almost like an accordion. The domains get squeezed, they get uh, more well-defined, sharper boundaries here, but they also get narrower and they move to the interior, um, uh, except for these anterior domains by, by giant and hunchback. They don't move, so it's only the posterior domains that move towards the interior. Okay, luckily, for me at the time I was doing my PhD, the model fit the data really precisely. You can see the early patterns are still a bit noisy. The late patterns are very good. And we um, uh, reproduce this sort of temporal behavior uh, of the data. Here you can see a beautiful time series of, of gene expression patterns, by the way. Um, and much later on, when I had my own research group in Barcelona, uh, 
we showed that you could do this with, with much sort of cheaper and, and worse data sets. This is going to be important when we look at evolution later on. <clears throat> Just very briefly to mention this, all you have to get right, um, so you can look at the RNA level here, because there's not much regulation at the post -trans uh, transcriptional level in this system. And uh, all you have to get right is the timing and the positioning of these, these boundaries. And then you fit the model to the data and you get um, uh, a model that reproduces those shifts. So what we did is we, we tried to explain what do these shifts do? These shifts are in, in, in an interesting feature of the system because they're very subtle. So you need really good quantitative methods to pick them up. Geneticists hadn't picked them up. And uh, you cannot explain them by doing genetics because there are no mutants that specifically affect those shifts. As it turns out, they're actually uh, coming out of a sort of a systems level behavior. And this is what we're gonna look at right now. So the quest here is to, to find out what is the mechanistic explanation for these um, shifts. And at the same time, connect that to a topological explanation from phase-space analysis of the model. Okay, so that's the task. So we started doing this. The first uh, publication I had on this was in 2004, a long time ago. And it turns out that the answer is quite fascinating. Here you see sort of time-space diagrams similar to the ones you saw before. So early is on top, then time flows downwards, and you see where protein is produced and where protein is degraded. So the, the bright color is production, the dark color is um, degradation. And what you see in those graphs is that each domain has a sort of offset. So the, the, the domain where uh, gap protein is actively produced is only in the interior of the actual expression domain. And there is a region of active decay if you look at this. So here you look at the, 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 the cut through this um, uh, and you see this is the expression pattern of the protein and this is where protein is produced and this is protein here in the negative where it is degraded. Okay, and it's the same for each gap domain. So basically, um, this is a mechanism that's based on the regulation of expression. It's not based on the diffusion of any protein. We actually showed that it works in simulations where you switch diffusion off completely. So it's a phenomenon that's based on the regulation, the temporal regulation of gap change. We wanted to know how does this work? But before we could do that, we could test this, okay? So we did a new kind of experiment at the time. We compared RNA and protein and found that indeed for all of these different genes, uh, the protein domain was uh, sort of, the, the RNA domain was lagging behind the protein domain. If you want. Um, so it's most clearly visible here for giant. There's uh, uh, in cyan, the, the RNA uh, uh, expression pattern um, represents the, the region of active production. Okay, and you can see that the, 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 the no, sorry, this is the protein, oh, I take it back, all wrong. This is the protein of, and, and the red is the RNA, um, the domain of active production. And you can see it's only in the anterior of the domain, okay? And so there's some, some area where there's protein still sticking around, but production of the protein has actually ceased the rate. Okay, so this is why the domain mo moves at some uh, level, but we, we don't understand it in, in causal terms, nor do we understand it in terms of phase space analysis. So what we can do with this model is we can sort of look into the black box that is this model and we can track every single interaction. So I don't want you to worry too much about these regulatory graphs. All I want you to see here is that it's a graph that goes over the, 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 the um, domain, the spatial domain of the model. So uh, there we're homing in uh, to an area here where um, uh, we look at the interaction between hunchback and giant and we can see <clears throat> on one hand, these colored areas um, show you that hunchback is, is repressing. Uh, the area here uh, represents is a measurement of the um, repression of hunchback uh, on giant, while here we have the reverse, sort of very little effect of giant on hunchback. So we can use this model and just by graphing these interactions, don't worry about the details at all. So we can, the important thing to notice here is that we have a method where we can track each individual interaction over space and time. And remember that we've formulated the model in a way that it is supposed to trace uh, causal interactions between genes. So basically the model gives us a method to look exactly when and where each interaction is important uh, in a way that's different from um, tracing uh, causal specificity. Remember that was done by measuring variation over a population. And here, and I told you, it's weird 
that uh, causality would be a population level sort of phenomenon. Here we can track uh, these interactions, causal interactions directly inside the model in an individual, <laughs> in a simulated, of course, individual fly. Okay, so doing this, we reconstructed this network. And now this is, is no, it's not just a network graph, okay? It's reconstructed from this dynamical simulation. And so each interaction here, we know exactly what it does and when it does it, okay? And so it looks very complicated. So let me explain this diagram quickly. So here's the interior, here's the posterior of the embryo and the background color indicates the main activating inputs from the maternal gradients. The boxes indicate where gap genes are expressed and these T-bars are repressive interactions among gap genes. You'll notice our old friends Giant and Kruppel here and their toggle switch, double negative positive feedback loop. There's another sort of feedback loop here and then a bunch of other repressive interactions. So the first thing we did is we just looked at this and uh, uh, classified each interactions uh, according to which feature of expression it contributed to. Okay, so you, you find that there are five basic dynamic mechanisms for gap gene regulation. The first one is broad activation by maternal gradients. Um, and that's no surprise, you know, the geneticists had already known this, but what's interesting here is the second one is auto activation, which was always controversial. So some of these gap genes need to activate themselves, but you can switch auto activation off in a simulation completely and it's compensated by increased activation by maternal gradients. So these two activation by maternal gradients and auto activation are a little bit redundant, which tells you that the activation of the maternal gradients, unlike their role in the French flag model, is not very specific. If you can replace the activation of a maternal input by auto activation, it is not setting positional information here at all, or you know, not to a large extent um, when gap gene regulation is also occurring. And those gap-gap interactions are really important. So the, the basic feature of the system are these two toggle switches, uh, Giant and Kruppel, and then Knurps and Hunchback, which, ha which have mutually exclusive complementary expression patterns. So we have very strong repression. And those toggle switch motives are basically creating the staggered overlapping basic pattern of the domains. Okay, They're important to stabilize and maintain and sharpen the expression patterns. The fourth uh, the mechanism was always very mysterious. There are additional repressive interactions among overlapping gap genes, like the one between Hunchback and Giant that I showed you in the graph before, okay? And so uh, we'll come back to those in a second. And then there's some repression by the terminal gap genes in the terminal regions, which just basically keep all the central gap genes out of that region. So we're gonna focus on this number four here. Uh, because this is what's causing the shift. Shift happens right there. And these sort of very weak interactions, which were um, always controversial because they're hard to detect and people didn't quite know what they were doing when they were doing genetics in the system. Okay, so these interactions we can see from the model are asymmetric. They go from the posterior hunchback to giant, giant to knurps, knurps to kruppel, kruppel to hunchback, not the other way around. So there is an asymmetry in those repressive uh, uh, feedbacks between overlapping domains. And they have to be very weak and hard to detect because these proteins co-occur in the same nucleus. So if they would repress each other too strongly, they could not be present like that. So this is the mechanism for these gap domain shifts. This is a mechanistic explanation that comes out of a dynamical systems model. But how does it work really, right? We still don't know. So let's look at each nucleus individually. And what I'm showing you here is a very sort of stylized um, uh, reproduction of the uh, region in which KNURPS is expressed. And you have early time is up here, late time is down here, and you're following nuclei in that region from early to late. And you can see that in the anterior, they express Kruppel in green. Here in the middle, they express Kruppel first and then uh, KNURPS. Uh, further back, KNURPS all along. And then if you go even further back, they express KNURPS and then Giant. And if you squint now, if you move a little bit away, you can see the KNURPS domain and how it moves apparently to the interior. So this is not real movement. Nothing is actually shifted. There is no diffusion or transport of proteins from one nucleus to the other. But it's like a Mexican wave in a stadium. This is it's called is a kinematic wave, where basically people throw up their hands at different times and you see the wave going around the stadium, although nobody is actually moving. Same thing 
for waves in the ocean, by the way. No water is transported left and right when the waves come through, just up and down, and everybody ends up at the same place. So what we're seeing here is that each nucleus is undergoing um, a sort of a succession of gene expression of different gap genes. And we can look at this in phase space now. And we can draw, it's a bit more complicated than the toggle switch. It's three dimensional. There's always three uh, factors involved. Here you have a phase space that has Kruppel, Giant, and Knurps as its uh, axes, the concentration of those factors, those proteins. And you can see that the system spirals very elegantly through this. So the black trajectory is up to gastrulation time. And this is an extrapolation of what the system would do if you would simulate it further, which doesn't make any sense in the real fly. Eventually, it would end up at an attractor, OK? And it has a, a weird shape here in the graph. It's a cylinder because this is not a normal point attractor. It's a, a spiral sink. Remember those where the trajectory spiral inwards, 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 inwards. So the system never reaches this attractor, but the attractor dominates the dynamics of the system because it creates um, through being a spiral sink and through moving around, here you see the attractor at different time points, it creates this, the shape of this spiral trajectory. And this is what we wanted. Remember, we wanted to find out the, the geometrical shape of, of developmental trajectories. Remember those diagrams of the Waddington landscape that I was showing you earlier. This is a literal sort of uh, measured extraction of such a landscape from expression data. Okay, so we've measured this trajectory out of the expression data, we've inferred it through the fitting of the model. Okay, so this is actually an empirical approach to look at the dynamics of the system. You can do this for all the different nuclei in, in, in this posterior region where KNURPS is shifting and you get this beautiful uh, fountain of spirals here, okay? So they're all very similar. They all show the spiral behavior. So you can, um, another interesting feature that you should notice is that they switch very quickly. They, they are in the Kruppel uh, KNURPS plane here, and then they suddenly switch and then they go over to the KNURPS giant plane. So you can unfold this phase space and, and put it in two dimensions, what we've done here, and you see a beautiful depiction. So what this means, this trajectory of the, the system, is that you first produce uh, Kruppel, then you produce KNURPS, and then in the end you produce uh, giant. Okay, so you cycle through the gap chain. So each nucleus is cycling through a stereotypical succession of gap chains. And depending on how much maternal gradient here in yellow, it's a hunchback maternal gradient, how much of this gradient you get, you will be cycling through this stereotypical succession of gap chains at a different moment in time. This, and this is difficult to understand, is like a clock. A spiral sink is uh, producing a damped oscillation. So this is an oscillator but nothing oscillates because you have to imagine it's a clock that only runs through a quarter of an hour. It's a very, very crappy clock and then it stops. And each nucleus runs through a different quarter of an hour uh, depending on the maternal uh, gradient that it gets. Okay, the concentration of the maternal gradient. Okay, so here is the topological explanation of the shifts. Okay, and to summarize this, so in the anterior, I didn't talk about the anterior where the domain stone shift, look at this uh, giant domain here, the yellow hunchback domain, they stay at the same spot. And the way they work is like a bunch of toggle switches, okay? They're just higher dimensional now. So basically you have different attractors in space and you have bifurcations that happen between those nuclei somewhere in the system, um, or basically the system, sorry, system crosses a basin of attraction and ends up in different attractors here. Okay, so it's, it's based on switches. It's a bunch of switches. And, and the domains stay the same, just like you would expect from the French flag. In the posterior, you have this weird clock-like mechanism that I've represented by this little collar wheel where different nuclei, they start at different points and undergo different spiral trajectories. So these are fundamentally different mechanisms. So the topological explanation tells you that this uh, is, is a switch-like mechanism here. Uh, where you end up depends strictly where you started. The system is dominated by its attractors, even if it doesn't quite reach them. And here in the posterior, the system stays very far from the attractor and spirals inwards toward them. Uh, and here's a classical damped oscillator. You, you see this is just to illustrate how different those two different mechanisms are. Okay, so fundamentally different uh, topologies of phase space, even though the patterns at first glance look very similar here. Okay, but these, they don't shift, they're stationary. So we have a topological explanation, 
And we have a sort of a very crude um, uh, mechanistic uh, explanation that says it's these overlapping, um, these, these repressions among overlapping genes. But you can, you can take a different perspective. Now we're taking a slightly different perspective on this system, okay? So another way to, to examine the causal influence of uh, a gene in, a, in, a, in such a dynamical systems model of a network is that you can knock it out. You can do a sensitivity analysis, either knocking out different uh, nodes, genes, with all their interactions, or knocking out specific interactions. So what we've done here is we've knocked out different genes, and we find out that there are three regions in the embryo, and the interior NURPS is not important. In the middle, giant is not important and in the posterior hunchback is not important. So basically we can reduce the, uh, or decompose the network, not into individual genes, but we can decompose it into different sub-circuits, okay? And so it turns out that these are the three genes that are active in the interior, no knurps, remember here? These in the middle, uh, no giant, and here in the posterior, no hunchback. Okay, and also no anterior giant, but that's not important. Okay, so, so basically, We've been, uh, we've, we, we have now decomposed the system into sub-circuits, okay? Just like we wanted to do with the motives and the community structure. On a structural basis, we've done this now through sensitivity analysis of a, of a dynamical system. So we've taken the whole system and we've just looked where are uh, which genes important, okay? So it's a very different approach to get at sub-circuits than the ones I've introduced you when we looked at network structure. It's a dynamical approach. And the striking thing about um, these circuits is they all contain different genes. There's a big overlap. Each, uh, two, each couple of them share two of the genes, but there's always one that's uh, different, right? And, uh, but the interactions between those genes are always the same. They look like this. And of course, this subcircuit is very familiar by now. It's the ACDC subcircuit. So we've, we've named these different subcircuits, ACDC1, ACDC2, ACDC3. And we can analyze those mathematically because they're simpler than the whole system. And we can show that this subcircuit is in a mode where this uh, positive feedback do dominates. So it, it creates switch-like behavior, while this circuit in the back here is in a mode where uh, the negative feedback um, dominates. So it's in an oscillatory regime. And the middle one, we're gonna look at that, actually has a bifurcation in the middle and produces, surprisingly, both switch-like and oscillatory behavior. So this is a, is a sort of a network deconstruction that doesn't go down to the individual level, but goes down to sub-circuits on the basis of dynamics. And we called these uh, dynamical modules. I'm going to have a full lecture on that later on. OK, so it's very different to notice that they're very different from motives because, they, first of all, they all have the same structure, but they do different things. There's even one that does two different things depending on where in the embryo it is. The same network does different things. And guess what? Structure does not determine function. Very important. So we need different ways of, of dissecting networks uh, than on structure alone. So I've demonstrated one of the ways here, a dynamic deconstruction of the network. But overall, I mean, the most striking thing is that there is no French flag here at all. Remember that in the last lecture, um, we looked at the claim that uh, using the French flag positional information approach, you can look at the error propagation in the system. So basically you have a very precise uh, expression patterns close to optimal decoding, but it doesn't tell you how the system works. If you look at how the system works, there's no French flag anymore because there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between specific readouts of the gradients and the position ultimately of the, the, the boundaries because we now look in time and the, the, that boundary domains shift over time. So where these uh, boundaries end up depends crucially on interactions among the targets. Okay, so to wrap that up, I told you, and this is from a very recent paper that I'm gonna share with you, um, Shannon information, positional information approaches applied to the whole network just give you error propagation how is positional information decoded, but it doesn't give you a mechanistic explanation. You can use information theory um, to build up a causal graph, a causal model of the system, but that is a form of decomposition. It doesn't, it, it just gives you information on <laughs> information on how the information flows in the network. Dynamical systems modeling now gives you a causal mechanistic explanation that tells you how those causal interactions act uh, together 
to create the output of the full system. And um, so the questions here is how is the average pattern generated? What is the underlying mechanism? And we've come up with the concept of general relativistic positional information, which is a metric helping nuclei to, to uh, sort of know, interpret where they are, but it's based on this dynamical system. It's a semantic type of measure. Okay, it's no longer a Shannon type information measure. It's totally okay to use the term positional information if you know what you're talking about, but it's used here in a very different sense based on the dynamic mechanism of the system. And so to summarize uh, what I just said is basically, you can use dynamical systems models if you formulate and validate them properly. So you have to have them formulated in terms of an interaction matrix of genetic interactions, you validate them, by fitting them to data and doing experiments afterwards, test their predictions like I showed you for the shifts, then you can provide mechanistic explanations for systems level dynamics. So genetic experiments and modeling work together to give you mechanistic explanations. And as a reminder, these explanations are causal even if they do not include molecular detail, that's very important. So you don't have to bottom out to the molecular level to get a, a causal explanation. We can trace individual interactions in model simulations, or we can do a sensitivity analysis um, yielding dynamical modules. That gives us different perspectives in terms of mechanistic explanations at the level of individual genes or mechanistic explanations at the level of these dynamic modules that we're gonna get back to later on. And so this approach connects topological explanations, phase-space analysis, oscillations, switches, right? This sort of uh, very broad analysis with mechanistic explanations. How do individual interactions or sub-circuits cause the orchestrated behavior of the whole complex system? Okay, so now we're gonna connect back in the next lecture and look at how these causal mechanistic explanations we have here inform us about the kinds of causes that act in complex systems, in feedback-driven systems, in hierarchical systems which will then bring us uh, to the much wider topic of why all of this, all these tools I've given you here, are completely inadequate uh, to understand the structure, the organization of entire organisms. Okay, so this is very complicated, but the main point is I'm showing you a bunch of tools, what they're good for, and you will find out that these tools are very limited in very different ways. That is one of the major uh, um, uh, points of this lecture. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I should stop here. I'm way over time. So I'll stop here and hope, despite my excessive ramblings, you will tune in again next time when we talk about causal flow in complex systems. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.